my name is Henry Crawford. I'm the, uh, I was uh, the curator of history at the Museum of Texas Tech University, and I was there for 26 years. Um, I've been working in the museum profession for 40 years now. Um, I've also been doing living history reenacting for the same amount of time, 40 years, and I deal with uh, most time periods in American history from the American Revolution to World War II. The museum so. profession, I've been curator, I've been a registrar, I've done education programs, I've done exhibit uh, uh, exhibits and uh, public programs and uh, many, many different other living history oriented uh, organizations. The American Mountain Men, which is uh, what we like to think of as the elite <laughs> uh, 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 organization for mountain men and fur trade living history reenacting. And I'm a member of that. It's, it's an invitation. Okay, um, well, after the Civil War, the Army uh, decided to reorganize itself, and in 1866, uh, they, uh, Congress approved the Reorganization Act, which did uh, quite a few things. Among them were the creation of all black uh, military army units. Uh, initially, there were four infantry units and two cavalry units. Uh, those four were the 38th Infantry, 39th, 40th, and 41st, and uh, also the 9th and 10th Cavalry. Uh, 1866, July of 66, is the beginning of uh, black soldiers serving in the regular army. Uh, during the Civil War, there was about 180,000 black soldiers in the Union Army. Many of those soldiers after the war, of course, went back to civilian life. But quite a number of them stayed in the army and became the core of what became these black black uh, regiments that served on the frontier. As time goes on, they start to deploy into other parts of the country and primarily uh, places like New Mexico. So by the 1870s, you have a large contingent of uh, black soldiers in New Mexico. We get that question a lot. <laughs> And the primary answer is that their hair looked like buffalo hair. That's, that's plain and simple. That's what it was. Um, we don't know who started calling them that. It may have been the, uh, uh, the Cheyennes in Kansas, or it might have been the Comanches or Kiowas in Texas. We Indians knew they were there. They watched them pretty closely, and they started noticing this similarity that they have with their with the tight curly hair and the hair of the buffalo and also many of these men had beards so a beard i don't have one <laughs> i used to but uh beards um were fairly common for men in the in the uh latter half of the 19th century and these black men weren't any different so if you notice a buffalo's head he's got a beard too so they see the curly hair they see the beard and they notice ah these men look like buffalo, and they're dark-skinned, so they look like buffalo. So they tended to be called buffalo soldiers. Uh, some people would say that they also called them that because the way they fought, they were real tenacious fighters in battle, just like a buffalo would. But I think that, that observation came along later. Uh, the first thing that the Indians would have seen was their appearance. They didn't necessarily call themselves Buffalo Soldiers right away. They were professional military soldiers, so they would, wouldn't necessarily call themselves that uh, officially, but they did later on. The 10th Cavalry developed a, a crest that featured a shield and a picture of a buffalo on it. So uh, we know that sometime during their, during their life period, during the 19th century, they did actually embrace that officially and became... Uh, and, and they would call themselves Buffalo Soldiers. As but far they as did it. actually embrace the spirit of it. So we know that. We know that for sure. Uh, yeah, Ready and Forward is, um, I believe that was 10th Cavalry. <laughs> we can, we will is the other one. And that's self-explanatory. We can and we will. Uh, without a doubt, they were uh, very proud of the fact that, that they, they, they could, be ready to go at a moment's notice, and they were um, uh, very confident of, of their, of their uh, ability to do what needed to be done. Right now, I'm wearing what's called the, uh, uh, the 1874 five-button blouse, and a, a jacket, this type of jacket was actually called a blouse. 
my stripes. Uh, I'm wearing the stripes of a sergeant. Three chevrons. That's a sergeant's rank. And my cap is called what's called a kepi. And this is a design that sort of relates to what was being worn during the Civil War. It's just a little bit different. And it's got the insignia of the cavalry on it and a 9 for 9th Cavalry. Uh, up until that time, up until 70, 1872, 74, the Army was using um, surplus uniforms. Many of these uniforms were in very poor shape, moth-eaten, um, more tailored to fit a person than what was previously used during the Civil War. And mine also has yellow piping on it, and the yellow piping indica indicates the cavalry branch. Uh, blue piping would indicate infantry, and red piping would indicate artillery. Now, if you're out on campaign, you might wear something called a campaign hat, which is what I have right here. This is what's called a campaign hat. It kind of looks like a cowboy hat. But it's actually, it's a campaign hat. About 1876, the Army decided to do away with that one and come out with a more of a, a Stetson-looking uh, hat, similar to what they still wear today. The uh, cavalry in the Army today, for ceremonial purposes, will wear their Stetsons. In the 1870s, by the time the soldiers, are, black soldiers are moving into New Mexico, they're being issued, uh, a, along with new uniforms in their uh, 1874, they're starting to be issued new weapons. A uh, single action army Colt revolver, 45 caliber, and it's uh, it, it, it fires a metallic cartridge and the powder charge and a bullet all contained in one unit. And that's what we're using uh, well into the uh, 19, well, through the 19th century and into the 20th century. So that's a handgun. Now we have uh, long guns. This is called the Trapdoor Springfield, the 1873 Trapdoor Springfield. And the way it works is you cock at the hammer back and you open what's open the breech block, which is called a trap door, and you take a cartridge. This is the cartridge. This is the cartridge for this gun. You put that cartridge into the breech, okay, close that, pull it back to full cock, and then you're ready to fire. And it's a single shot weapon, it's a very, very powerful weapon. Well, soldiers' units weren't really disbanded so much as they were incorporated into the Army. And at 1948, um, uh, President Truman instituted the, uh, his, um, his uh, executive order uh, number 9981. In 1948, you no longer had segregated Army units. You had an integrated Army. These Buffalo soldier units were incorporated into that, and even today... The 9th Cavalry still exists. The 9th Cavalry Regiment is part of the 1st Cavalry Division that's headquartered at Fort Hood, and they're still around today. They ride helicopters. They were very active in the Gulf, very active in Vietnam. They, they, had, they traded in the horses for helicopters in Vietnam, and, uh, and they rode uh, armored vehicles. They were, today, they were, ride Humvees and tanks and things like that, but they're still 9th Cavalry. The, uh, the government used the army quite a bit in um, not only policing the uh, forest, forest lands, uh, uh, forest national parks, things like that, uh, but also, again, helping to build the infrastructure in these national forests. Putting out national fires. Some of the first uh, forest, forest firefighters were soldiers, and a lot of them were black soldiers. Horsemanship at West Point was taught by Buffalo soldiers because they were the best riders. They were the best horsemen in the Army. These uh, black soldiers were teaching horsemanship at West Point. Uh, we had uh, people like uh, Gen General Grierson, Colonel Grierson, who commanded the 10th Cavalry throughout pretty much all of its existence. He commanded the 10th Cavalry. These people understood what black soldiers were capable of, and they went with it. The, uh, the commanders that they had who truly believed in what they were doing. A big part of what the Army was doing out on the frontier was mapping and surveying and exploration. That's what they did in Texas, New Mexico, looking for railroad routes, searching out the best water routes, searching out the best terrain. So Shafter and his 24th Infantry, uh, 9th Cavalry, 10th Cavalry, all of these guys, one of their primary jobs was surveying and mapping building roads, building the infrastructure of the West that we actually enjoy today. 
Yeah, Henry Flipper was the first black graduate at West Point. He wasn't the first black man to attend West Point, but he was the first black graduate of West Point. And during his time at West Point, he was subjected to quite a bit of racism. But anyway, he graduated in 1877 with, a, with an engineering degree, as assigned to the 10th Cavalry, uh, went out on the frontier, uh, served primarily in Texas, New Mexico. And I think one of his jobs was taking care of the regimental funds. Uh, and what happened was, I believe he borrowed some money from the regimental fund and intended to pay it back, which a lot of officers would do. It was very common to borrow money from the till and put it back. And this is, this is a very common thing, but he did it and they accused him of theft. Uh, the charges were brought up against him. He was court-martialed and he was discharged, dishonorably discharged from the army. During President Clinton's administration, President Clinton reinstated uh, Henry Flipper to, to his rank and position in the army. I think in a way he kind of got the last laugh because his engineering training he formed a uh, company, an en a civil engineering company, and made him a fortune. Together, and Pershing was a uh, was a young officer in the uh, in the army in the 1880s. This is sort of near the tail end of the Indian War period, but certainly in New Mexico and Arizona, there was still quite a bit going on in the 80s. Uh, uh, and Pershing was there, served with the 10th Cavalry in Arizona. He was a young captain and uh, served with distinction. He really liked him a lot. As a matter of fact, um, one, of the, one of his contemporaries who knew him quite well was the artist Frederick Remington, who also traveled with the 10th Cavalry in the 1880s and 1890s in Arizona. So he, he knew firsthand also what the Army was up to and what the black soldiers were doing, and he depicted that very well in his artwork. But Pershing... Um, had quite a distinguished career. Uh, later on, uh, he commanded a punitive expedition into Mexico after Pancho Villa raided um, Columbus, New Mexico, and burned the town to the ground, <laughs> basically. Well, the army sent Pershing along with a huge contingent of town into, into Mexico after Pancho Villa, and the 9th Cavalry and the 10th Cavalry were there with him. Interestingly enough, also, another young officer who accompanied Pershing in Mexico in 1916 was a young officer named George S. Patton. Later, General Patton was Pershing's aide. <laughs> he, was on, he was on Pershing's staff, and he proved himself quite a fighter too. But one of the neat things about Patton was that he saw also firsthand what these black soldiers were able to do. So when he became commander uh, of troops in, the, in World War II, he made sure that there were black tank units with him. I know that there were uh, quite a few uh, black troops who fought in World War I. Uh, I don't know what the units were. I, I, I believe there was still 9th Cavalry, 10th Cavalry fighting in there, and also also over here stateside doing support roles. So uh, there were some overseas. There were some hurt here stateside as well. And World War II, there were two black divisions who fought in World War II, uh, one of them, uh, they were in Italy, primarily in Italy, and their their crest, their unit emblem was the the silhouette of a buffalo, oh. and they were called the Buffalo Buffalo Division. Uh, and then there was another one that fought in the Pacific. Patton had black soldiers under him. Though the the those uh, tank units were under Patton, but yeah, he had he had tank units under him, black tank units under him. So they were fighting in every theater of the war.